good morning for another six minutes and then it'll be a good afternoon. The chamber uh, membership really appreciates the opportunity, um, appreciates the fact that you are here and are getting the opportunity to hear both sides of a pretty big issue that's going to be on the November ballot. I'm Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Gresham Marriott Chamber of Commerce. I'm really happy and pleased to be able to have that role and I plan on having it for another seven and a half years. Next year, I will say the same thing. I want it for another seven and a half years, and the year after that, another seven and a half years. So you're stuck with me for at least seven and a half years, however long that is. Um, we could not do these forums, or a lot of the things that we do, without incredible sponsorships and support from our members. So I want to introduce some of our sponsors today. Our presenting sponsors, we actually have two presenting sponsors of the Government Affairs Luncheons, our BLTs. One sponsor is Portland General Electric and Dean Funk is here at the front table. Thank you very much Dean. <laughs> the PGE can give money to a lot of places and this is one of the buckets that they decide to support and we really appreciate. And Riverview Bank, speaking of buckets of money, um, Riverview Bank, I waited till you sat down Larry so that I could introduce you. Larry Schwartz is with Riverview Bank, another presenting sponsor. Thank you Larry. And someone who doesn't get to attend very often because she has 12,000 kids that she takes care of. How many kids do you have? 12,000? 12,643. Okay. Seven of them are mine. So I want to thank our stakeholder sponsor, which is Gresham Barlow School District. And Dr. Pereira is here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Pereira. We appreciate you coming. And Metro East Community Media. Keith? You're not the fake news, you're the real thing. We appreciate you being here today. I want to remind you that when you, um, when you get to see this in real life, but if you missed anything, there are replay schedules and Keith has provided them. They're at the registration table on your way out, so be sure and get one and tell your friends so that they can become educated on this issue as well. Um, we have some elected officials with us today. One in particular that will be on stage pretty soon is the Metro Councilor, Shirley Craddock. Shirley, thanks for being here today. Appreciate you. And I've got two bosses that are here, so um, at attention I am Dean Funk of Portland General Electric and Jim Hathaway, Transamerica Financial. They are board members of the chamber. Thank you both very much for coming. So the issues are shaping up. We've got Measure 102, 103, 104, the Metro Housing Bond, Receipts Tax in Portland, and the list, I mentioned this last month, the list is big. A lot of candidates are on the ballot as well, and we are starting to get inundated with, no matter what media you listen to or, or watch, you're starting to get inundated with all that information. And today is a great day for you to get educated about what's gonna happen, um, about how you can vote on the Metro Bond. So I want to set the stage before I bring up the chair of the Government Affairs Council. On Friday, I did, I got heaven points on Friday. I took five of my seven grandchildren to Mount Hood Theater to see The Incredibles, and then I fed them pizza at my house, and then I had all five of them spend the night by myself, my husband wasn't around, and then they got up in the morning and I served them 65 pancakes. They were dollar-sized pancakes, but they were having a race to see who could eat the most of the pancakes. And it was 7.30, and I had already made the decision that they couldn't watch television or have screen time until nine o'clock. So who does that punish, you know? Um, it's one of those, you're grounded, and then you're the one that really is the grounded person. So the kids are going, no screen time, but Grandma, it's your house. We always watch a movie, blah, 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 blah. And they're good kids, but I said, you know, I had to stick to it because I'd made the decision the night before, hoping they would sleep in. Anyway, so they decided that they would together play. And I had purchased 13 sets of magic tracks. And if any of you have done these, these are really fun. You hook them together and they're flexible and they glow in the dark. 
So you can see them on your way to the bedroom after the kids have left them out there. Um, but then they come with a car, with cars, and they, they go on the tracks, you push the button and away they go and you can do all kinds of things with them. Well they got out all 13 of these and they started to lay the tracks out all over my living room and dining room area. And they built ramps so they, they would go up and they did a, a circle one and they, I mean they had so much fun and then they got the pizza box, pizza boxes from the night before and my husband's um, drop top beer con cardboard container and another couple they went out to the recycling and they got all this cardboard and they started making a town. They started making towns and houses and all this kind of so that the tracks could go by it. They did bridges and all kinds of things. It was really fun. Three hours they did this. So just about two hours in, one of my grandchildren came in to where I was, just a couple of feet from, from the living room, and he said, Grandma, is this your retirement house? Where did that come from? He's playing tracks and cars and they're racing. Where did that come from? I said, well, I, yeah, I guess it would be my retirement house. I want to live here until I die. And he said, good. I want you to stay here till you're dead. <laughs> The whole point was that he really enjoys coming to grandma's house, our home. Whether they're outside with the bear and the coyotes that ate one of my chickens last week, or um, you know the swing set, whatever it is, playing in the, in the water feature that we have, or inside playing cars and, and with his cousins and doing whatever. He loves the home. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's called a housing bond, but what we're really talking about are homes. Homes for someone, right? So with that being said, I am going to introduce Brian. Um, today you get to ask questions, but we're gonna ask that you put the questions on the paper. And there's not enough for everybody at every table, so if you want a question, ask a question and write down, there's not a form, just let me know and I'll get you one. So Brian Lessler of PDG Construction Services, would you come on up and introduce our guest speakers for today? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna take my track. I was hoping you'd leave those here for me to play with for a while. <clears throat> That's a hard story to follow, isn't it, about homes and housing? So today our speakers are going to be presenting both perspectives on an issue um, that you will see on your November ballots. And I'm speaking about Metro's proposed uh, $652 million housing bond, half a billion dollars. Uh, as is our process, the chamber um, wishes to provide information so that as a business owner, as a manager, as an individual, you can make informed decisions um, <clears throat> about how uh, this issue or any issue might affect you. And um, so really today is no exception. Um, information on both sides of the Metro bond measure will be presented by two highly informed speakers. So our first speaker, uh, not in this order necessarily, but uh, Mr. Andy Dyke, has a depth of experience uh, as both a business owner and a politician. Uh, he was elected as the District of Four Washington County Commissioner in 1994 and served in that role for 16 years. And in 2011, uh, Andy was sworn in as the board chair and still serves in that role. As I understand it, you are the commissioner at large. Uh, <clears throat> um, Mr. Dyke was raised uh, in a farm outside of Hillsborough, obviously Washington County. Um, and attended uh, Portland Community College. Uh, in 1983, he founded Dyke uh, Machinery, or Machine Inc., uh, which produces metallic and plastic components that are currently marketed uh, throughout the country. <clears throat> he is certainly not shy about com community involvement as he, you can find him involved in the Hillsborough Chamber of Commerce, uh, Association of Oregon Counties, uh, on the Governance Committee, Special Operations Committee, 
um, Metro Policy Advisory Committee, um, Washington County Visitors Association Board of Directors, and Westside Economic Development Alliance. <clears throat> what do you do in your spare time, anyhow? Spare time. Yeah, what spare time? And just to prove that he doesn't have much spare time, um, he's also a family man. <clears throat> in fact, he has enough kids to field a basketball team with a couple of reserves on the bench. So uh, we know he's a very busy guy. Also, um, sharing the podium today uh, with Mr. Dyke is Councillor Shirley Craddock. <clears throat> and I know to many of you, Shirley, uh, certainly in this community, doesn't need much of an um, introduction. But <clears throat> if I didn't give her one, I'm afraid I'd get fired, so here we go. Um, Councillor uh, Craddock was sworn into office uh, as a Metro Councillor for District 1 in 2011, I believe. Is that correct? Okay. Got good information from somebody. Um, she's now uh, serving her second term as Metro Councillor. <clears throat> And in her district, she represents, um, as most of you know, Gresham, Fairview, Troutdale, Wood Village, um, parts of East Portland, I believe, unincorporated Damascus, and Boring. So it's a, it's a very big geographic district. Um, prior to, prior to uh, serving on the Metro Council, uh, Shirley was a Gresham City Councilor uh, from 2004 until 2010. So, uh, and, and in addition to that, she's a retired uh, registered dietitian and health researcher. Uh, she served uh, in the Kaiser Permanente Center uh, for Health Research for almost 33 years. She and her husband, Dick, uh, and you would never believe, I can't believe you've done all that stuff, right? Um, she and her husband, Dick, have lived in Gresham since 1979, and uh, I enjoyed being her neighbor for a good part of that time. Dick and Shirley have two daughters, Emily, who live in Portland, and uh, who lives in Portland, and Amy, who lives in Salem with her husband, Mark, and their three children. Uh, Councillor Craddock is an avid runner, <clears throat> competing in road races for over 33 years, including many hood to coast relays. I can attest to that because I used to ride my bike out in East County all the time. I would see her way out in the middle of nowhere, and I'd think, how in the heck did she get here? I wonder where her car is. Um, and I'm on my way back, Shirley's running home. I'm thinking, ah, she didn't bring a car. Um, she was a prolific runner. Um, both speakers today are very passionate uh, about the livability of our community. Uh, but I think you will see that they each have um, quite different perspectives on the $652 million metro housing bond. So each speaker is going to be allowed about 20 minutes to uh, present their information. And after that, we're going to take some questions. Um, as was previously mentioned, we'd like you to use the forms that are on your table. Um, if you run out of forms and nobody brings you any, you can just jot it down on a piece of paper so, uh, and get it uh, either to Lynn or to Angela. Uh, they'll be circling the room. So starting today, our first speaker, Commissioner Shirley, or Councillor Shirley Craddock. Please welcome Commissioner Shirley Craddock. Welcome, Shirley. It's good Thank to see you. you again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it, and you're having your having getting your interest in this uh, initiative that the Metro Council is uh, um, asking the voters to approve in November. And uh, so, I thank you for the time today. You know, when most of us grew up, you know, I'm a baby boomer, and I assume a few of us in this room are in that generation. Uh, we, you know, we grew up with that American dream, you know, that if you work hard, you get a good education, you find a job, you're going to be able to buy a house. 
and you're going to be able to start a family. And, and that's what our parents all taught us. Life will be good. Uh, and, and in the Portland area was the best place to live. It's a beautiful area to live. We're, we're so fortunate that it's such a wonderful place. And of course, as you know, a few more people have th thought it's a good place to live and are moving here and is contributing to this challenge. We have good schools, we have parks in our natural areas, we have a high quality of life, and we really value our community. But times have changed, and they're changing fast. Today, you can work full time, put, pull down an average salary, and still not be able to even rent a one bedroom apartment. In fact, there is now no neighborhood in the entire Portland metro region where the average full-time wage earning renter, a person that makes $17.84 an hour, can afford a modest two-bedroom home, rental home. You either have to work close to 60 hours a week at that wage to, to be able to, or, or make over $25 an hour to be able to rent a two-bedroom apartment. As the cost of living climbs, we are seeing the, the significant impact. People are forced to move further and further away out to those outer cities, Estacada, Camby, Scappoose, Vancouver, uh, you know, into the McMinnville area, Newburgh. Um, this affects, it's challenging for them, it's more expensive, you have high transportation costs, but then you also, it contributes to the challenge with congestion and more automobiles on the road. Students are forced to change schools, sometimes multiple times per year as their families bounce from place to place looking for a place that they can afford. How can children be successful in school when they have to move often? More people are sleeping outside in rundown motorhomes that they pull off to the side of the road or try to camp in overnight at a park. They're sleeping in their cars and, and the shelters are full. There just isn't room for everybody. Even middle class families are struggling just to keep their head above water. While too many people, seniors and people with health issues and the truly poor, face real homelessness. So I want to thank you today for your um, interest. You, you know, I know you always, I always enjoy your, your uh, forums, you're uh, engaged, you're in, interested in all the different kinds of issues that we all have challenges in this region. And as I look around, I know you're a very, uh, very thoughtful group, you care, this is a compassionate group. Many of you are very involved in um, other organizations where you're trying to raise money for special needs, special, special issues. And housing by far is one of the most com complex public policy issues that we face today. It's not a surprise to me that the conversations we're having about these ballot measures are also complex. This is a regional problem. This is not something that's just in Gresham or Wood Village or Troutdale. None of, none of our communities are immune to the fact that rent and housing costs have gone up faster than our incomes. We see this impact again in our schools and on our streets and our workplaces. Uh, it's really challenging to recruit and retain employees. We each have people in our communities who are unable to respond to these rising rents. And for those the least able to respond, uh, the market ch changes, the solution is a, ho is a home that is affordable. So the strength of this bond measure and why we're approaching the region on it is that it, it really is all about local control. Metro is the financer of this. We are not, the, we are not going to be the, the manager of the funds. We'll be kind of the bank, but it's going to be the cities and the, and the local agencies that are, will, will have this responsibility to build this housing. Uh, the funds raised by this bond will be sent back to the local jurisdictions and the housing authorities. That's like in, in Multnomah County, that's Home Forward. In Washington County, that's the Washington County Housing Authority. In Clackamas County, that's the Clackamas County Housing Authority. The funds will also be sent back to those jurisdictions, those cities that also already receive uh, federal uh, dollars from our housing, uh, from HUD. That's the city of Gresham. That's the city of Portland, that's the city of Beaverton, and the city of Hillsborough. So this is the work that the cities and counties will be do, do already do today, and they are the ones that are, going to be, that are under resourced to, do, to deliver the, these needs that we have for housing. Through our stakeholder process and the preparation to approach the voters with this bond measure, uh, we define what portion of the funds will go to each county. And we are distributing those funds based on the assessed value in each county. So 43% of the funds are going to Multnomah County, 34% of the funds 
I'm sitting here suddenly hesitating on my numbers, are going to um, Washington County and 21% to Clackamas County. So we already know how we're gonna be distributing these dollars. We know that this is not a panacea. We know it's not going to solve all the housing problems. And, uh, there are 24 jurisdictions within the metro boundary and, uh, and who have authority over some or other solutions that, uh, regarding housing. So things like addressing system development charges, I know Andy will probably be bringing this up, and permitting, those are other things that we need to consider doing on how we're going to solve some of the challenges that we have with the high cost of, out, of, of housing. Asking voters to approve a bond to build housing should not change the pressure that we put on each other to address these issues. This is the exact role where this is the role that government should be playing because the market is not meeting these needs. The, the private market, the developers are not building housing that meet the needs of the people that we're focusing on. Uh, we need housing in our community that serves people with very low and fixed incomes. We're focusing on those people that earn 30% of the average median income. Affordable housing often means the difference between being forced out of your community or becoming homeless. This ho the housing uh, isn't profitable and will not be built by the private market, so that's why we as a government agency are stepping in. At addressing this originally benefits, it, um, spreads the benefits and the costs, and this is exactly why Metro Council decided to do this. Because we have that reach to the millions of people that are within our boundary, we share that responsibility amongst us. And so we're able to ask you for this for 24 cents a, a thousand. And so that is, a, so we spread that out, so it's, if like if the city of Gresham and even the city of Portland are at, ask for the same amount of funds, the, the uh, commitment or the, the challenge for you to be able to afford that is much higher. And Metro can deliver. We have a lot of experience. We now have um, three bond measures behind us already that we've beautifully managed in 1995 in the natural areas bond measure, in uh, 2006 the second natural areas bond measure, and then in 2008 the Oregon Zoo uh, bond measure. The Oregon Zoo bond measure was um, path, was you voted to support that in 2008. We are now in 2018. Ten years later, construction costs have gone up 30 percent, and we're beginning the last project this summer, or in just a few weeks or months, and we'll we'll be able to complete all those projects on time and on budget. So uh, we've tr we, uh, we have trusted community partners who are ready to work with the local jurisdictions to implement the bond. I know one concern that's been raised is uh, the perception of the local subsidy that will be required to implement the bond. With our constitutional amendment, that's a, that's a, a measure that is accompanying this, Measure 102, we need your help to also uh, pa um, say yes to that. That is a measure that the legislature is approaching you on, and what it will do is to allow public dollars to be shared with uh, local nonprofit organizations to be able to leverage the dollars that we have. Those nonprofits, those organizations that have been around for a long time, you, many of you know Human Solutions and Catholic Charities and REACH and Rose Community Development Corporation, all of those are really reputable nonprofits that have been building affordable housing for many years. And be able to share these funds with them will leverage the dollars that we have available. Uh, I know that Andy probably will bring back the notice about vouchers. We, uh, you know, the vouchers are where we, uh, are, um, we get these from the federal government. They help buy down the rent for these renters. We don't have enough, and we're working on that. I and mean, it's a continuous effort that we're putting into this to be able to um, get more vouchers. And so that's been something that we've been foc focusing on. So, so doing nothing is not an option. I've heard, you know, that from uh, some that uh, this is just a drop of water in a bucket. Uh, you know, it's not going to help. But we do. We plan to help about 12,000 people uh, to be able to get housing. We recognize that we have many more that need help. But if we do nothing, doing nothing doesn't get us anywhere. Before we can help those over 12,000, we need to build the first 12,000 um, enough housing for 12,000 people. So it's something that is not something that we should just say, oh yeah, this is too challenging. This isn't going to really make a big difference, we shouldn't be do it. That's not the right answer. So I, um, I'll stop here, um, but, and, I, I just, um, and let, of course, let Annie take the next step here, and I'm glad to take any of your questions when there's a, um, uh, after we both uh, make a, a presentation. So thank you for your being here today and your interest in this, and glad to answer any questions that you might have uh, in a few minutes.
Consortium. Welcome. Thank you. Please welcome Andy. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for having me out today. It, it was a beautiful drive and certainly a good excuse to get out of the county office and get out here to, uh, to beautiful Clackamas County in Gresham. I don't often get off the beaten path, so we are actually in the city of Gresham still, aren't we? With us? Yes. Okay. Oh, Multnomah County. I, I apologize. I thought this was Clack the Clackamas County side. You're right. I should have known with Diane here. Okay, well, I'm geography challenged, I assume. But, but it was a beautiful, uh, a beautiful drive. And, and to tell you how important this was, Lynn and I had gotten our wires crossed and I didn't expect to be here today. Today is our board day, our county board day, and we had some very important ordinances on there. I, I had to rearrange my schedule so that I could be on the phone telephonically as I was driving out here, just so I could be here to talk about this issue. I, I always am challenged to, to go up against Councilor Craddock because she's so nice and so eloquent and I can't disagree with most of what she, what she said. There is definitely a housing issue. I don't think any of us would deny that. And we can tell a myriad of stories about, uh, about people who are on fixed income, people who are, who are on uh, low wages, who are trying to find a place to live. You heard earlier that I have a number of children. Uh, my three oldest are, are looking for a place to live and have been for quite some time. They're in that category. They're struggling to find a place that they can even rent. But that does not justify the only tool in the toolbox if the tool is wrong for the job. And that's the point. That's the point I'm making right here, uh, right up front. Because when we talk about this bond measure just being a drop in the bucket, well, it isn't just that it's a drop in the bucket that's going to help a few people that, are, that really need housing. It's the other side, the people that it's going to hurt. That's what we need to be looking at as well as those whom it's going to help. So if you assume, and I'm, I'm using Metro's own numbers, that there's a shortage of about 40,000, 40 to 50,000 affordable units throughout the Portland metro area. And this bond measure, assuming that measure 102 passes, will build about 4,000, something less than 4,000 units. That's about, I'm, I'm going to use the number 10%, 40, or 4,000 out of 40,000. So let's just assume that one out of every 10 people are lucky enough to draw that lottery ticket and get subsidy to, to move into a home. The other nine, including my children, will not qualify, but yet will pay higher rents because of this measure. That's the point. And we need to look at the, the damage that's done as well as the good before we assess whether or not we go to the public and ask them to put out their hard-earned dollars for 30 years. This is a 30-year bond. It may be paid off early, but we are voting on a 30-year bond. So, I guess what I'm saying is we need to be very circumspect about the harm that it does and the good that it does and see if one outweighs the other. You cannot ignore those who are struggling who will not qualify for either HUD vouchers or, or subsidies. Which takes me to the other issue. We do have a limited number of HUD vouchers and we're using those HUD vouchers now. They come predominantly from the federal government. You can't just run out and ask the federal government to give you more. Um, it's, and so there's this presumption that local governments will have to kick in some sort of a subsidy to buy down those rates. That's the dirty little secret in this whole thing, is that you're voting on a bond measure for 30 years to pay for the construction or the purchase of the homes, and there's nothing affordable at that point, even though it's called an affordable housing measure. It isn't until those subsidies are placed in there by local government that the housing units actually become affordable. So um, we need to look at the whole picture before we make a decision. I know that this is a very emotional argue, uh, issue. I know that all of us see the same thing. We see the homeless on the street, we see the person in the doorway or under the bridge, and we say we've got to do something. And certainly we do need to do something. But this is not the answer. Now, um, Councillor Craddock referred to some other steps that I've advocated for. Um, and I'm afraid that if we run to the taxpayers and just ask for more money, it does take away the pressure 
that would cause governments to, uh, to take those steps. And those steps are lowering the cost of housing in the first place. This situation we're in today, this didn't happen overnight. This was predicted a long time ago. In fact, I was at a uh, uh, housing forecast way back in the recession where it was predicted we were going to be in this exact same situation. And they said, we only have a six month supply of housing. And the answer from those who, who were policymakers at the time was, well, nobody's buying housing. So why should we add land to the UGB or encourage housing, reduce regulation? Why should we do any of that? Nobody's buying housing right now. They missed the boat. And they'll miss the boat again if we let them off the hook by, by uh, taxing ourselves to solve the problem. What I'm advocating for is that we have a true 20-year land supply. I'm not asking that we blow the, the urban growth boundary out. But what I am asking is that when land is brought into the UG, that, we, that we, we be a little bit more honest about what is developable and what is not. Damascus was a big mistake. The last cycle, when we said that Portland would grow up, not out, that was a big mistake. We predicted at the time that in order for them to do that, they would have to build 7,000 units per year for the next 20 years in order to do that. And they had never yet done it once. And they haven't done it since. So these types of mistakes and bad decision-making policies have to stop now. And we cannot continue to, to uh, enable any government, not just Metro, this is not a Metro thing. We cannot enable any government to, to not look at the root causes of the problem by just throwing more money at it. So um, I wanted to make one last point, and that is, and this is not an anti-Metro thing, please forgive me if it comes across that way, Councillor, um, but it oftentimes does. I am the chair of the Washington County Housing Authority. <coughs> I did not ask Metro to step up and, and uh, promote this bond measure on my behalf. Now, 34% supposedly of the, of the funds are supposed to come back to Washington County. It's not in the measure. It's in a resolution that, that this will happen, which means it could be changed. There's no guarantee that 34% will come back to Washington County or that 20-some percent will go to Clackamas County or 40-some percent to, to uh, Multnomah County. So, I, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a top-down process rather than a bottom-up process. Instead of the three housing authorities coming to Metro and saying, we can't do this on our own, please do this on our behalf, this is being foisted upon us. So um, along those same lines, when we talk about how that money is going to be distributed back to local governments, because you would think that as a, as a housing director, I would be one of the first with my hands out saying, yes, please, give me 34%. We want to build more houses. But in Washington County, we are pretty efficient at it, and we are building uh, uh, nearly as many houses today, public housing, as what Metro says they will build with this bond measure. And we have done it without raising taxes, and we'll continue to do it. Um, so uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is this is really the wrong tool at the wrong time coming from the wrong place. It is incumbent upon government to, to uh, plan for public housing. It is not Metro's role to plan for public housing. Metro is a planning agency that should be looking at the big picture, but they should not be usurping the role of local governments. I guess, uh, where, where are we at time-wise? Has anybody been keeping track? I wanted to make, oh, okay. I wanted to make one last point here. Um, Gresham is, um, has a, a large amount of affordable housing, what would qualify as affordable housing. In fact, I would uh, say that you probably have one of the larger proportional rates of any jurisdiction in the metro area. But yet, your citizens will be paying this tax and the money may not be coming back to Gresham. If you look at it on a, an equity basis and what areas should be taken on more affordable housing, you may not be getting the money back. Now you may, but we don't know. There are too many things in this bond measure that are not fleshed out yet. The, the agreements between Metro and local governments have not, been, have not been agreed to yet, the intergovernmental agreements, and so we only know what we are going to be voting on in this measure. And that doesn't specify how the money flows, 
uh, who it will flow to, or any of those things, or, or which jurisdictions will be winners and losers. So with that, I will, uh, I will step down, and, uh, and Councillor Craddock and myself will take questions. Does anybody have a question? Can you reach hand it up? You guys are off the hook. There's only one question, and it's eight pages long. So. Okay. Okay, I'm going to speak to the two people that are up here. Hello. You want to? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay to share the stage, right? Okay, there we go. And I'm very okay. pleased to, to share it with Councilor Craddock. She has always been so polite to me. So polite. All right. Okay, this is questions for both of you. How much of the bond measure goes towards actual construction? And how much to maintenance of the units? That's the first question. So can we answer that question? How much will go towards actual construction and how much to maintenance of the units? So the first thing is that we've already made a decision that, and it's in the bond measure, that we will not, the administrative cost to, to manage this bond measure will be no more than 5%. <coughs> so the, uh, the rest of the funds will be used for housing construction. Uh, take away 10% of that that will be used to purchase land out ahead and, and do some land banking. So the Metro will have, will, will manage the uh, fund, the bond measure with 5%, and then another 10% will be used to purchase land out ahead in our transportation corridors for future housing construction. So the rest of the bond measure will go to construction. So the way it works is, is that um, the Metro will not own the housing. It's going to be owned either by the housing authorities in each county, or it's going to be owned by, if Measure uh, 102 passes, it's going to be owned by the nonprofits. And so what ha the way this works is you get the cost of the construction down to an amount that is doable. So you can have rents that people can pay that, are, that they can afford. And so they, in that process, they, they figure out how much money they need income coming in to maintain those facilities. So that is part of the process. Is that, so none of this money is going to be used for maintenance. It's all for construction. And then each organization will, will be the owner of those properties and will maintain them into the future. And they will manage how those rents will be um, identified to be able to make sure there's adequate funds available to maintain them over time. So the next question from the same person who must um, deal with this kind of issue on occasion. So that it's approximately 162,000 per unit based on the information that was given. So what's the cost for private industry on a per unit basis? I don't know that. Are, are, we, are we talking private industry or private development? It says private industry, but perhaps yeah. private development, if you would happen to know that amount. Well, it's per yeah. unit. Yeah. The cost, the, the cost of construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much equivalent. I mean, there's been some arguments. It's been all over the board. There's been arguments even from our side that uh, the public can't build it as, as efficiently. What I've heard from other counselors is, um, is that there is not going to be an emphasis on construction as much as there is on purchase of existing units. Regardless, I think the thing that gets mi missed in this discussion is that whether you purchase or whether you construct, there is a limited supply of land and a limited availability of units. Therefore, you're only displacing what would have been built in the private market. So either you're buying existing structures, which may or may not be low income, and you're taking them off the market so that they're not available for redevelopment to get the infill that, that Metro has said that they wanted, or you're taking existing bare land and you're constructing, in which case uh, the private market will not have land availability for, for construction. But that really doesn't get at your question, which is really what is the cost, one versus the other. So I guess I'll just add one thing to that. This is why Measure 102 does need to pass, because if it does not pass, the gov governments, local governments, meaning Washington County and others, will have to own those units, because you can't use bond proceeds together with private development to, uh, 
so the, the government must own the asset, I guess is what I'm saying. And if the government owns the asset, then you have to build it using Dave, Davis-Bacon uh, labor, which means that it'll be more expensive. If you go the other way, you get some economies. So just for clarification, if 102 doesn't pass, then Metro would own the properties. No, the housing authorities and the, the housing the authorities would. would. So then going back to the maintenance question, it would be the housing authority that would be dealing with the maintenance and not the private um, entities that 102 would then provide right. for. Is Reg that correct? Re regardless of which way you go, the housing authorities will be responsible for the maintenance. Oh, okay. Piece. And Home okay. Forward already has been doing that for many years, and they okay. have lots of experience doing that. Yeah. Okay. So here's a question, and I'm going to see if you guys know where this came from. You have highlighted the fact that rent is, uh, in the area has outpaced salaries. This is especially true for our teachers <laughs> and likely other professions. We have a growing need for highly qualified teachers. One in four can... Uh, walk out today fully retired. Really? Wow. How can we collaborate, leverage, and leverage money and investments and our creativity to help our teachers that it becomes a win-win for future affordable housing for teachers and help boost economic development in our area? Thank you very much, Dr. Pereira. <laughs> So it's about a profession that should be able to afford, but obviously it's an issue here. So the question is, how can we boost the economic development and, and make affordable housing for teachers, or houses that are affordable for teachers? Well, I, I think you made a good point, is that it just shows how challenged it is right now to be able to have rents that are, are that the average working person could afford. And teachers that are beginning their profession, that are new in the profession, they, the rents are high enough now that they cannot afford to live in the Portland metro region. That's, I think that's your point. Is starting salary, both teachers, firefighters, police officers, they're all part of this group. So the point is just to, to um, point out how challenging it is right now. These are people that are well educated. They've, you know, they're ready to have, be in their profession, but it's still very challenging them for them to find housing that they can afford. Andy. Uh, I would I would have to agree. It's it's all professions, and in fact, um, I have a machine shop. You heard that in the opening statement. Thirty employees, and many of them fall into the income where they they're right on the verge um, of of being able to afford units or not. So it's across all all professions. But I, I think what I'm advocating for is that this is not a solution. This actually exacerbates the problem. But the solution, I talked about land supply, that's only one part of the, uh, of, of the equation. Another part is the cost of construction, meaning SDCs, fees. I put that on myself. Local governments and special districts have charged all these fees up front to where, at least in Washington County, the fees can be as much as 25 to 30 percent of the cost of new construction, and that's insurmountable. Now, some folks have said that the market will never build for low-income housing. What I would argue is that the market cannot build for low-income housing as long as government stands in the way and puts the fees on, restricts the land supply, and all of the other steps that we've taken. However, it can go the other way. It, it can go the other way. We can't guarantee that the market will. But the market at least can start to work on the lower income housing if we take care of those, those issues I just mentioned. So we talk about fees. So right now, the average SDCs throughout the Portland metro region is somewhere between 35, around $35,000 per house. And so let's say those are fees that the cities use and the counties use to build roads, to build their sewer systems, to build their water system, to build their parks. And these are fees that are also used, that the cities and counties use to um, apply for grants from ODOT or from uh, the state of some sort or the, even the federal government. And, the, to, and nowadays, if you're going to get a grant to build a new road, you have to have matching funds. And so the system development charges are used for that. So let's say we take away those fees and reduce them. So who pays that? Who is going to help? pay for that amount of money that the cities need to build the sewer systems and the water systems in new development. 
Is that the responsibility of those of us that already live in the city? Do you want, should we raise utility rates so we will, the cities can bank and put money aside to be able to have money available for when new development is ready to go, they can build that new development? That has been the long-standing discussion for years is who takes responsibility for the infrastructure to support new development. Is it the current resident in that city or that county or is it the people that are moving here? And when your system development charge is a pass-through fee that go that the land or the housing, the person buying the house ends up pay, um, paying for because that is what's needed to be able to see that those systems are in place. Now when it comes to permitting, I understand that that's a different, because I know there's, I hear amazing stories of regarding the city of Portland, some of their permitting fees. But the other, the other challenge with this is cities hire staff when they need those staff to help with new development. They're not, with, you know, they don't have planners hanging out waiting for the next developer to come in uh, to be able to help uh, with that process. So as uh, development uh, is development begins, and we're in a good economy, right, there's lots of development, so the cities have had to do a lot, and counties have had to do a lot of hiring to make, staff, make sure they have adequate staff available to do, to see that that development um, meets the city's codes. So that, is, it's a, you know, it's who, who pays. And so I recognize, do we want to reduce the price, uh, the cost of SDCs? Do we want to reduce the, the um, cost of permitting? Then who's going to pay for that if the current, um, the new development doesn't pay that as, they, as it occurs? Okay, I have six really good questions here. It's going to be a lightning round, but no yes and no's, okay? Mm -hmm. If the Metro bond monies are intended for residents at 30% or less of the AMI, how will dollars be addressed for workforce housing targeted for residents at 60 or 80% of the AMI? The current uh, market will take care of that. We are, in fact, there's housing already uh, being planned to be built in Gresham really uh, very soon. That will, there'll be, it's called mixed income housing now, where uh, new development will have market rate housing and will have housing in the same building for people that are 80% of average median income or even 60% of average median income. Okay. If, if I could address that, this is one of the sticking points that my staff has had. Because Metro set a very laudable goal of 30% or lower median income, I mean, it sounds great, but in practicality, it doesn't work because what it means is that you have a, an apartment complex and you're going to have uh, most of the residents, if not all, at, I think, actually, I th I got to be fair here. I think they were talking 45% of those residents would be at 30% or less. Essentially, you create ghettos. You don't want to have an entire uh, construction project that has folks of 30% or less because it, it doesn't, it's not good for society. And it doesn't pencil very well as, either. Um, when we do our projects, we do 80% or less of medium, median and, uh, and there's mixed grades all through there. And so those who are paying close to 80% are subsidizing those at the lower rates, and you get the mix of incomes throughout there, so you don't create those ghettos. One of my points that I've been saying on, on the road is that because this is going through Metro, any government who does it, whether it's Metro or some other government, is gonna put sideboards on, because they're the fiscal agent for these bond measures, and, and they will put sideboards on. So they're telling us what that mix of income levels is gonna be, and it's, it doesn't come out the way it would and the way it should in the real world. It doesn't come out to our benefit. Another quick question. What types of housing is expected from the bond? Do we know? I'm, I'm not sure what that is. What types of housing? Tiny be, houses, be, tree houses, apartment houses, what types of housing? Family. It'll be along our transit corridors. Yeah, I, and I, I think I have to agree. Everything I've heard so far, it'll, it'll be a mix. It really depends what opportunities come available. Okay. By building and providing housing to low-income folks, aren't we raising the costs on the next layer of homeowners? Won't it make it harder for even more people to buy homes? So this is that transfer of costs. I think 
that it was spoken about already. I, so you, I assume that person is referring to the cost of the bond measure, what it cost to, to Correct. the taxes? Mm -hmm. So the, this tax is going to be, uh, so the average assessed value of homes in the Portland metro region throughout the entire metro region is $250,000. That's assessed value, not market value. And we've checked our numbers more than once, uh, and we know that's an accurate number. So, and so if you look, when you look at your tax statement, you know you're looking at two values. One is your assessed value, and then of course what you can sell it for is a bunch of different number. So let's say, uh, so that the average home that is $250,000 a year will pay $60, $5 a month, $60 a year. Let's say your house is twice that, because I recognize most of us, our homes are more than that. So let's say your assessed value is $500,000. You now are up to $120 a year. That's what this, and that's why Metro can do this, because it's only 24 cents a thousand. So the, it's the, it's a, tax rate is very low compared to other taxes. For example, I know when the school districts recently have had to, I've asked for the voter support in both the Gresham um, bar Bon measure and the Reynolds, those tax rates are about, I think Reynolds, or Gresham's $1.86, I think Reynolds is a little bit less than that. So there's, you can see it's almost five, six times larger than what this ask is. So the cost that's getting passed on is really very, very small. And we were even calculating, so what's going to be the average um, amount of burden on the at renter? And it's maybe $12 a year. And that's, so that's exactly why we're doing this. That's why Metro Council has taken this responsibility on, is because we could spread that responsibility out throughout the entire region. And we all have less re responsibility, less of a burden. Um, the, co the cost analysis is, is also a key part of this whole thing. Uh, Councilor Craddock is correct that the average cost is, uh, is about $60 per home. However, we have these two things called Measure 5, Measure 50, which means that any home built after Measure 5 and Measure 50 are a much higher assessed value than, than the, the homes built prior to that. So if you follow the line of reasoning here, most of our apartment complexes and, and housing, and especially the housing that's built for those who are coming next, as in your question, those are going to be a much higher assessed rate than what the average is. And so the question is very valid because it really does push the cost up for the, the next resident who wants to move here. It's, it's inequitable. And in addition to that, um, you have different areas around the uh, around the, the region, which have older homes, which will be locked in at a lower rate, and then you have newer areas, and so those newer areas are gonna be paying a much higher rate. So anyway, it's, it will affect folks in the future. Oh, uh, last point, um, when the cost goes up for the landowner, I don't know of a landowner yet who doesn't seriously consider what his fixed costs are and add that on. Now, it may not be immediate, it, there may be a delay, but those costs will be added on and the renter will pay them eventually. Well, it's not just renter, it's the business owner that passes on. It's, so it's property taxes, not just on houses, it's property taxes for everything, right. correct? Yeah. Okay, just double checking. Question, who is supporting this measure, endorsing the businesses or organization, and who is opposing it? We have, what, how many? Uh uh, Chamber of Commerce that have opposed, but we have over 500 endorsers. Uh, some of the endorsers include 500 chamber endorsers. No, it, 500 oh. endorsers throughout the region. Okay. And I, I was given the list and I left it at my table. But I know we have all major business organizations are supporting this: Westside Economic Alliance, Portland Business Alliance. Um, oh, Westside Economic Alliance didn't support it. Well, they did. I was thought, okay. Uh, excuse me. I, uh, anyway, so we have uh, we have over 500 endorsers. I apologize. I need. Um, can, I'll give you time. To, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so we left this at the table for you. So the Portland Business Alliance, uh, Northwest Natural Gas, uh, Oregon Smart Growth. So we have we have a significant group of people, okay. organizations, and and businesses that are supporting us. Are they individual businesses? It's any small ones? Or are they all larger? Corporation um, type. Where is? I get, I could read well, the list. Yeah. Uh, to, sa to save us some time, I would I would concede that in this there are a significant number of folks that that are supporting the measure. Those who are opposing it, the the chambers of commerce in Washington County predominantly, Hillsborough, Beaverton, uh, Tualatin. Uh, I don't believe Wilsonville's taken a position yet. 
the Portland Metro Realtors Association opposes it. Um, there are several other groups, uh, the, the Washington County, um, uh, shoot, there's, there's a Washington County Business Council. Uh, so we are clearly outnumbered if you just look at who's supporting, who's opposing. But the more telling issue here is that of all of those on the list who are supporting the ballot measure, not a single one of them asked for the opposing view which gets to my point that this is a very emotional issue. When somebody says, are you for affordable housing? Of course you are, and you're gonna sign on quickly, and that's exactly what happened. Okay, another question. <clears throat> there are many agencies and jurisdictions working on affordable housing. How does this bond intersect with the system of housing low-income people and the other efforts of those working on this issue? In other words, this is, this is one component of a very large issue. So how is the, what's the intersection? What does it look like? So the stakeholder group, the, the organizations that already do affordable housing were all part of this. We've almost over a year ago, we started meeting with them and, sh and developing and shaping what this is going to be like. So they are all participating. And they've, uh, so they've not, we have a, a stakeholder group and we have a technical group. And they're the ones that are very experienced, have been in the business for many years, and have really were on the ground helping us make, figure out how to make this happen. And so they're very involved. Okay. And Okay, so I'm going to butcher this question a little bit and take out some of the guts of it. Developers cannot afford to build to rental rates at the HHI. So how do we make housing affordable so that they can build? Well, I, w I would argue that uh, developers could, but if you have a piece of property, you're going to, you know, we have a, 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 a market out there and you're not going to build to, uh, to not make a profit. You're going to build for the market. So that gets back to my point. You're always going to build for the best return on your investment first. But as there are more builders out there and more property available to build, it moves down and it gets to those who are at the lower income brackets. If government gets out of the way and lets that happen. If government doesn't let, let that happen, then they're only going to build to the high income. Because a good example is um, uh, Lynn Peterson was talking the other day about, uh, about moving into an accessory dwelling. And she was talking about the SDCs on that accessory dwelling. They are the same whether it's a, a hovel that she lives in or whether she lives in a mansion. So why wouldn't a builder build the mansion rather than the hovel? And that's what we need to change. And again, I say if, if we jump to taxation first, it takes the pressure off of us to change those things that we should be changing. Okay, can we do the math? Shirley, you said 24 cents a thousand. Mm -hmm. What's the average home in Gresham? Is it two? 360. No, 360. That's too hard of a math number. Assess value now, not assess value. Not sorry, value. assess value. Do we know that? The Sue, do you know in the that? Region is 250. Uh -huh. Well, it's less than 250 here, but we could use right. a figure of probably 200 and be relatively safe. So, what's the tax rate on it then? What would the tax burden be? Cents 24 cents, but what's the math? 24 times 240. $48. $48 a year, is that what it is? Okay, that's for a home? For 30 years. For 30 years. For the 30-year number came back up again. Remember, that's existing It's what? Well, that's on existing properties. Existing properties. That's on, that's on residents. What did you say? That's on residences only. Residences only. Dealing with what the impact would be to business properties. Right. Yeah, and I brought that up too. It's not just for homes. It's for everybody that has a piece of property for whatever reason they have it. Okay. Um, if the bond measure passes, how do you plan to work with school districts to plan for student population growth? In other words, if the houses come, so will they. And who or how will the, lo the localities ex assist school districts in preparing for the growth? I would assume that this would be a combination metro and probably much more the, the, lo the local cities. And I think, that's a, I think that's something we definitely need to be doing more of, is working with the school districts, looking at what their population projections are, and then identifying how much housing do we need and figure out what, we're, what we might do about that. OK. 
Okay. Andy, do you have a, a comment on how the interaction with school district well, could I, happen? I, th I think Councilor Craddock said it, said it best. In Washington County, we work closely with our school districts to talk about where growth is going to occur, and that's based on the decisions Metro has made about expansions of the UGB. And that way, school districts can plan for future schools and the transportation projects. We work jointly on the transportation projects to make sure that there aren't traffic jams heading to those schools. So, it, yeah, it's just we see it happening, and then we react to it. Mm -hmm. Did you learn something new today? Yeah. yeah I, 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 don't tell me how you, what your vote was going to be, but did anything you heard today change your mind move, movement one way or the other from where you were when you walked in the day about the bond? So you came in, you knew what you were going to do, and you're going out knowing what you're going to do, right? <laughs> But with more power because you gave you got new information today. Andy and Shirley, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate that. Okay, I need my notes so I don't forget anything. I'm putting this down, Keith. All right, I want to thank again our sponsors, Portland General Electric. Dean, thank you for your very in-depth question as well. Riverview Community Bank, thank you for the first question. Larry, wherever you went. And because Dr. Pereira doesn't get to come very often, I let her have two questions today, so thank you very much. Metro East Community Media, please pick up your replay schedule and watch this again. Um, it, Andy's right, he, he moved mountains or a lot of cars to get here today. I booked it with somebody else and he said, yes, Andy will be there and Andy didn't get the message and, and so he did actually go above and beyond and we really appreciate it. And Shirley jogged down here from her home. So I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, appreciate both, um, both of you and your efforts. So next month, I don't know for sure what next month is going to be and it depends on whether, on what EMI um, the success of EMI's uh, candidate forum on Thursday morning and if we don't feel like enough people have seen candidates yet then we'll try to help fill that in and if, if we do in, do in fact see that then we will have a different topic in October so we're trying to work hands on with with EMI but we do have an economic summit coming up and it's going to be right here in this room only spread out because we always have about 180 people. The Economic Summit title is Puzzle Pieces. And we've um, got John Tapanya is going to be here from Eco Northwest. He's our keynote speaker. Todd Davidson, who is the executive director of Travel Oregon, is going to be here. And then we're going to have a, a very distinguished panel as well, 7.30 to 11. That's on November 8th, two days after the election. So you're all going to go, whew, that's over. Now what's the future? So that'll be fun. So pick up your replay schedule schedule stay in your home until you're dead we'll see you we'll see you next month thank you for coming
Thank you.